Um, I'm standing in the White House shaking President Obama's hand and, you know, wearing a medal and, and doing all these really cool things. It's like, after something like that, a, a simple job interview doesn't seem so intimidating, right? <laughs> you know, so it has this wider ripple effect that, you know, you get these kids involved in these situations where they're pressured and they're molded and they're pushed and formed and grown and it, it improves their quality of life down the down the long stretch for sure and it's it's really exciting to be part of that this is the tom roland podcast fascinating stories to amaze encourage and inspire you in fishing fitness and the outdoors and we're brought to you by black rifle coffee I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Hi there. My name is Tyler Marin, four-time Paralympic athlete, motivational speaker, personal trainer, owner and creator of Revision Fitness, the audio fitness app. And this is the Tom Roland podcast. We are, we are doing it right now. So Tyler, Hi, how I'm are in. you, man? I'm in, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. I'm, uh, visiting the in-laws and and uh having a great time this is uh trip number four uh in a row coming up for me so i've been on the road a little bit but life is good i'm feeling super blessed and having tons of opportunities to uh, uh kind of give back to the community so life is really good well it's uh it's an honor to speak with you you're you're four-time uh olympian paralympian um and your sport is goal ball is that right that's right. So yep. explain goal ball for somebody yeah, that doesn't know to. about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Goal ball is, <laughs> we like to refer to it as the greatest sport you've never heard of. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's so fun to get people involved in it. I've, I've never introduced it to anybody that didn't just take to it immediately, whether they were playing it or watching it or, or volunteering to help out. So, um, goal ball is, it's, it's a unique sport because it, it's actually been around for quite a while. Um, it's over 75 years old. It was invented in Germany after World War II to give blinded war veterans a form of recreation. Right? You have these, these jocks, these athletes that, that go off to war and they, they get injured, they lose their vision, they come back. Well, they're, they're the same guys, right? They're the same jocks, the same athletes, the same competitive spirit. And so these physicians got together and said, Hey, let's create a game for these guys. And, um, it kind of grew and developed into a big international sport from there. And, uh, the long and short of it is, is, uh, it's on a volleyball sized court and you've got a large goal at each end. So that's why they call it goal ball. It's, uh, think of an overstretched hockey goal. It's about a meter and a half high and nine meters wide. And the three players for each team will kind of position themselves in a wedge formation in front of the net uh, and work together as a team to defend the goal, like a soccer goalie would. Mm -hmm. Um, Every player that plays is visually impaired, right? They're legally blind or totally blind. Um, But everybody wears a blindfold, uh, a mask totally blacks out any, any potential usable visions all based off of sound and uh, the ball, which is, it's about the size of a basketball, just a little heavier. It weighs about three pounds and it has bells inside. Hmm. So as we throw it back and forth, 
it's, it's more of an auditory cue. You listen for the sound of the ball and then you, uh, put your body in front of it again, like a soccer goalie would putting your body in front of the ball to, to stop it from going in the goal. And it's just a quick back and forth kind of volley, um, a lot of underhand throwing. It's not overhand so much, a lot of underhand, uh, step and throw high speed movements. So in the, uh, upper men's division levels, you know, we throw the ball at each other, uh, 40, 45 miles up to 50 hmm. miles an hour. Wow. So it's pretty quick. Yeah. We're, we're not real nice to each other. So <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of fun with it though. And, and, uh, and again, I, I just, I love it so much because uh, you know, my, with my vision getting worse as I get older and things like that, that the sport doesn't change. It's, it's not about my vision. It's about, uh, my ability to just be a good athlete and work hard. And, and, uh, it, it definitely is something that's special to me. Nice. I watched one of your videos and I noticed that, that you were wearing, um, what looked like eye protection, but it's a blindfold and everybody wears yeah. that. That's, that's very interesting. Cause I guess there's varying levels of, of, of blindness and somebody might have, you know, partial, partial sight. So this is le- leveling the playing field completely. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Nice. That's great. And so, um, let's talk about your story. Like, uh, your, did you, um, when did you start having, uh, issues with your vision? Yeah. So, if we, if we jump in the way back machine all the way to 1984, when I was born, um, I grew, <laughs> grew up on a farm in Southwest Michigan. And, um, it's interesting because my parents noticed something a little bit different about me when I was a kid, uh, from my siblings, I, I had some odd kind of tendencies, right? I would, I would, um, you know, when looking at people, I, my eyes would kind of shift to the side. I couldn't really look at people directly. Um, when, uh, when we'd be out at, at night, even, even just like in, in kind of dim lighting, my vision would go super quickly. So one of the kind of side effects of my, uh, eye condition is, is night blindness. Mm. So where dim light, a lot of people can still see mine just goes, goes super quickly. Um, and so when I was around three, four years old, my parents took me to a specialist to try to diagnose what was, what was going on. And, um, you know, we got this diagnosis from the doctor and, and unfortunately it was, it was really dire. Um, this specialist essentially told my parents like, Hey, I'm sorry to tell you this. Your, your son has an eye condition. It's going to eventually render him totally blind. He's, he's essentially going to be helpless the rest of his life. He's going to need to go to a special school. He's going to need to live in a special home. He's going to need somebody to take care of him 24 seven. Wow. And it, it was just, such a trippy experience. Now, I, you know, I was little, I don't really remember this. My dad tells me about this and driving home from this uh, doctor's appointment and him just having to pull off to the side of the road and just sit and breathe and try to sort this out. Right. Like this is, this is wild news for, for my parents who are uh, simple nine to five folk working hard and, and no, no experience whatsoever with uh, blindness or the blind community or what, what people in that community are, are capable of. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, just uh, growing up in that setting where, you know, my, my parents took that and they, they really, um, one of the magical things that they did and something I thank them for to this day is they kind of worked through that and said, you know what, this isn't, this isn't a death sentence. Um, we're on the farm. we got a lot of chores to do. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with his back. Right. <laughs> and so we're, we're going to get some stuff done. We're going to let him figure this out. And and they did ultimately, you know, we, we would adapt things. Um, we're out playing baseball with my cousins. I got the big Nerf bat and the beach ball in, <laughs> instead, you know, and so <laughs> little things like that. And we just kind of figured it out as we went. And my parents said, look, he's, you know, we're not going to put him in a corner. We're going to, we're going to help him figure this out. And really around the age of 14, 15 years old is when my vision started to decline really, really poorly. Uh, you know, quite a bit, like, yeah, that's when I really started not being able to read my textbooks in school and things like that. And, um, that was the, the age when I, when I got diagnosed officially with legally blind, uh, status, um, what, started getting the, services the and condition all. called that, yeah. uh, retinitis pigmentosa okay. is, is the name of it. And just kind of a fancy term for saying that my, my retinas, um, overproduce pigment. So if you look at, uh, kind of the, the typical 
image, a picture of a retina. It's kind of a healthy pinkish orange kind of color. Mm-hmm. Um, mine don't look like that. The mine are, are real dark and uh, dark and white kind of mosaic looking pattern. It actually looks really cool. If you look at a picture of it, it's just, just not very functional. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and that, that kind of just slowly kills off my, uh, the retinal cells. And, and so my vision kind of over time slowly collapses in. Was there, um, w- was there any, um, solution posed at all, uh, when you, when you were young, like, is there, was there an operation or, or any sort of, is there anything that, that was out there that might help? Yeah. There's always new stuff developing. When I was originally diagnosed, um, I went to the University of Michigan and um, got a whole bunch of testing done. Um, They took a gallon of blood and (laughs) about a thousand pictures and, you know, all kinds of genetic testing and things like that. I think it was more research based at that point. And and now there's a lot of... uh, options that are cropping up for Mm. like specific genetic components, um, stem cell therapies and things like that, depending on, um, the genetic variation of it. Cause retinitis pigmentosa has dozens and dozens of, of genetic variations. So it kind of depends on, you know, which one you have, but, uh, up to this point, not really a ton of options. Mm -hmm. Um, more just kind of dealing with the, the, the vision loss as it comes and, and figuring out how you're going to, you know, function through that. Right. Yeah. Um, we had a, my son had a, had a vision problem, which is what led me to, uh, to, to start researching, um, Lawrence Gunther, who's the one that, that connected us together. And, and, uh, you know, he's, he's a, a blind angler and, um, I don't know, I just became more, aware of the blind community and and just issues because my son had this uh this condition and it started kind of similar to similar to yours like not not quite as early but around 14 or 15 he his vision just started to decline at a rate that was very abnormal and uh he had keratoconus and um Keratoconus okay. is for anybody that doesn't know, you probably know what it is, but uh, if anybody that doesn't know, y- your eye should look like a basketball and it looks like a football. It kind of elongates out. If you have keratoconus, the, 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 the um, fibers of the eye are not strong enough to hold that kind of round shape like a basketball and it ends up elongating like a, like a football. And um, every year that it goes, you know, it, it gets worse and worse and rubbing your eyes makes it worse. And he has allergies and boy, his, his vision just started to decline so quickly. Um, and, and we did find a solution, which was remarkable and incredible. And, um, thank goodness for smart people like Dr. Yeah, right. Brian, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler in California. But, uh, uh, he had a, uh, had a procedure that, that, stopped it. And, uh, it was, it was amazing. But Wonderful. before that, you know, it was, a it was a, um, a complete, um, um, they would chop off the end of his eye and use a, a, a cadaver eye to, to put that back on there. And it sounded like that in itself had very low, um, you know, success rate to begin mm-hmm. with. So yeah. we started trying to look for other things, but, uh, luckily, you know, this, this doctor in California had been doing some, some really incredible work and had done some work with, with another Olympian actually, um, that, that did the bobsled. And there's a great book about, about that. Um, Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and the bobsled driver, uh, had keratoconus and he was going blind and, um, it's really a, really a, an amazing book. Um, but he, he worked on him and then he ends up winning the gold medal. Uh, the whole team did. Um, That's so cool. Yeah, it was, it was really great. And then we had a, uh, we had an experience where I had the doctor, um, the, the bobsled driver and my son all on the same boat and we filmed a TV show and we all did a, did a oh, show there together. Awesome. It was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And, and, and just one of my favorite memories of, of the whole television career. But, um, in, in all of this, I become more aware of like just the, the, the visually impaired community, the blind community, because, you know, we were, 
we were looking at that like, okay, well, just like your parents, like, okay, what is this going to look like? Um, because the doctors are telling us that he's going to lose vision within a couple of years. And, um, you know, there's really very few options. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why I looked up uh, Lawrence and then was so excited to talk to you because it's just, it's just so cool. Um, you know, what you've been able to do uh, by coming a, a Paralympian and the motivational speaking and everything else. And, and so many, you know, there's so many people that I have on the podcast and that, that have undergone uh, or, or, or experienced challenges in their life, whatever they are whether they're physical challenges or mental challenges or, right. yep. or, yep. or whatever it is. And you just kind of, you know, I always look to stories like that. Like if you can overcome this and experience the success that you've had in your life and continue to have, then how can we apply that to other problems? You know, problems yeah. that some people think are really huge and, you know, it's like, okay, let me show you a big problem. A big problem is yeah. not having vision, but it's all, it all at the same time, I don't know how you feel about this, but it's kind of, you know, somebody can have a self-limiting belief that can be as big of a deal as not having vision. Like it just stops them dead in their tracks. And yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So what absolutely. are your, what's your, how, how did you and your family kind of uh, go down that path and start to overcome these, these challenges that you were, you were experiencing? Well, I think it's, uh, it, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. Um, I think that your, your limits are in your mind, mm. right. And, and there are so many people who, um, they have really, really, uh, dire situations and yet are, are, you know, the happiest <laughs> yes. successful people that you'll come across. Right. And then other people where you, you kind of look externally, right. There's the, there's the internal and the external, and you kind of look externally and like, what do you have to complain about? And yet they, they just seem so, so down and so defeated. Um, I, and I think so much of it starts in, in your head, right. It starts in your mind. And, um, you know, for my family, I think it was a combination of, of things, um, a, a little bit of serendipity, right. Some, some folks stepping in, at the right time with the right resources to say like, Hey, this isn't a big deal. We're you're good. We're good. Um, it was, uh, you know, a little bit of internal stuff, you know, again, growing up on the farm and just, um, being, uh, given that kind of attitude of like, you know what, there's work to be done, make mm -hmm. it happen, you know, mm -hmm. figure it out, let's get it done. And so just, I, I I think that I've been really blessed to come to this, this conclusion that you're talking about of like, okay, yeah, being visually impaired or, or, you know, fill in the blank, right. Being deaf or being, uh, what, whatever your, your challenge might be. And maybe it's not even a, a disability, whatever challenge you're facing, like, yes, that is a hard thing, but what are you going to do with it? Right? right. Your, your options are to, to kind of sit down and mope and roll in the mud or get up and, and make something happen. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, a good example of, of kind of how this came around for me, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm 15 years old. I'm just, just being told that I'm going to be losing all my vision. I'm, I'm not going to be allowed to drive. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is blowing my world up. Right. And, um, I, I was introduced to adaptive sports through a, a sports education camp for kids who are, are visually impaired. And they, uh, you know, at this camp had mentors and, and people I was connecting with and got introduced to goalball at this camp. Uh, so it was May of 1999, the first time I ever played a game of goalball. And I started getting around these people who, essentially had this attitude of like, Hey, you're going blind, whatever, no big deal. Let's go play some ball. Right. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are like going to college and traveling the world, getting degrees, running businesses. And it's just like, wow, this is totally doable. So, uh, you know, I think there's that other layer too, of just sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And, and so, you know, my parents, again, great examples of like, they didn't grow up in that community. You know, you talk about with your son, uh, getting this diagnosis and it's like, I'm guessing at first it's like, holy cow, what does this mean? Like yeah. you don't, you don't know anything about this community or what people in this situation are, are capable of. But um, I think in general, like you can take that principle of 
it, if you, if you think you can, or you think you can't so you're correct, right? Like yeah. a, the good old Henry Ford quote, one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. Mine too. And, and, you know, you can take that and you can apply it across the board, you know? So when I give my motivational speeches, one of the the steps that I talk about, I, I call the the presentation, seeing the true champion within one of the steps is deciding it's possible. Mm. You know, you, you think about a, a Roger Bannister breaking the, the sub four minute mile and, um, you know, other things like that, like people who said, you know what, I think this can be done. And they just went and did it. Yes. And now that, now that people know they can do it, it happens regularly. Right. Yeah. So even high school it, athletes are doing it. it. Right. Right. It's wild. Right. So, yes. um, and I just, I just think that's the the biggest thing that I love to, to try to share with people, you know, is whatever challenge you're facing, like you, you still have something to give, you still have something to, uh, to offer people. And, if you, if you allow your situation, your disability or whatever it is to, to trump that, then, then you're, you're shortchanging the world with, from, from your gifts. Right. Wow. That's powerful, man. I, w- I was just talking about, um, something similar to this, this morning in the workout, we were talking about, um, words that you may choose not to use as often. One of the ones for, for my children that was, was just a, a standard rule is, is the, the word can't. I just mm-hmm. didn't, I don't like the word can't. I didn't allow them to use the word can't. And we had lots and lots of, of discussions about this because they would say, well, why not? I mean, why don't you use can't? And I said, it's simple because as soon as you use the word can't, you shut off all the possibilities for your brain to figure out how you might be able to do something. Yes, sir. It just shuts it down and you don't become creative. You don't ask for help. You don't figure out a way. You can't fly. Yes, you can. You can get on an airplane. You can get on a hang glider. You can, you can, (laughs) you're flying. There's lots of ways you can fly, but you have to think creatively. Like, can you flap your arms and fly? Well, not yet. Right. But, and that's what I was trying to instill in them is like, but as soon as you say can't, it's over, it's over. You just shut off all creativity. And, and what we were talking about this morning is, is uh, my friend said, well, there's another word that he was listening to a podcast and it had Matthew McConaughey on there. And one of the, his words, um, and he used the, the, the four minute mile analogy hit one of his words that he doesn't like to use is unbelievable. And he just said, you know, everything that you see today, any kind of record was once thought of as unbelievable, but someone believed it. Someone believed that they could do it and they did it. And then it became commonplace like the four minute mile, which is still an extraordinary athletic achievement, but it's far more common. I mean, they, there used to be newspaper articles that said that, you know, Roger Bannister's heart was going to explode if he ran yeah. this, this, you know, four minute mile. And it was absolutely humanly impossible. Well, it is now to that person. Right. Like, right. like if yeah. you think your heart's yeah. going to explode, you know, absolutely you, you may not be able to, but I like that. Um, you know, I thought about that with unbelievable and, and, and just, that's just one of those other words that, you know, if you believe that it's impossible, then it probably is for you, but yeah. somebody else believes that it is possible. And yeah, I, I was at a, a camp, uh, just recently. Uh, I think I mentioned this teaching, uh, uh, kids who are blind and visually impaired, and I got to stand up in front of them and share my story and, uh, give my motivational speech. And, um, I, uh, I, I shared a really, it's, it's a really corny joke about <laughs> blind, uh, pilots. Right. And it was just, it made everybody laugh and it's, it's a fun joke, but it, um, but I, I shared it and I told them now, you know, I, I want you guys to understand. I shared that joke because we all think like, it's funny, right? Blind pilots. Oh, that's silly. That can never happen. I actually know two guys, two separate individuals who are, who are blind, who have their pilot's licenses, who fly airplanes. Um, you know, they have co-pilots that, that fly with them that read off their instruments for them and all of that stuff. But they, these guys fly planes. Right. Mm -hmm. So right back to what you're saying, like, as soon as you say you can't do something, well, then the door closes, but instead of asking, can I do it? 
you ask the question, how can I do it? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, your brain starts turning, the creative juices start flowing and then, you know, solutions start to start to crop up. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I was just, I was blown away after this presentation because we did this kind of Q and a time and the kids are asking questions. And this one kid says, Hey, you know, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be, I want to be the first blind astronaut, but you know, for, for the longest time I thought, ah, there's no way I can do it. And, um, you know, it's totally a, a sighted thing. And he said, do you, do you think I could actually do that? And I just, I was actually kind of taken aback. I was like, wow that is the coolest thing. I was like, <laughs> I said, I don't know how it can be done, but I'm not going to stand up here and say that it can't because you could be the first blind person to be an astronaut, right? Like you, the, the work that you're going to have to put in, I, I told it to him straight. I was like, the work you're going to have to put in would be crazy, right? You're going to have to reinvent the wheel in a lot of ways, but absolutely something that could be done. And, and uh, you know, just, that mentality. I just, I love to see that in, in kids and just people that the light bulb comes on and possibilities open up. It's just, it's the coolest experience. Yeah. And that's so cool that you are providing that to so many, so many kids that are, that are, you know, going through this, this challenge, maybe they were born blind or maybe they have, or, 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 having a situation like you did where they're, they're going blind and you're such a, a, a an incredible, um, resource for them, impact, mentor. Whereas you contrast that to the doctor that diagnosed you and is telling you or your parents that you're going to have to be taken care of all of your life. What do you, when you think about that these days, I mean, that is such a, a fixed mindset kind of thing for a doctor to say to someone. I mean, was it just a different approach back then or was it that particular doctor or how do you think that that would be different if the doctor had said you know what he's he's probably going to go blind and let me show you all these different resources of of things that blind people can do and he can be totally self-sufficient and on his own i mean do you know what i'm saying like how yeah. how would how would that have been different and do you think that doctors are are having a different approach to something like that these days well, I think it's, it's a, a little bit of, of both where, um, I think that the information at that time was a little bit less prevalent. Now there, there had certainly been very, very, uh, affluential, um, successful blind people at this, this time period, right. Mm -hmm. Um, many, many people that have predated me and, um, many giant shoulders that I have stood on. Um, but I think also now that, uh, it, it's just become more understood Now there are still certainly doctors out there. There are still pockets of people. I mean, I, I face it all the time. Uh, people who, who just don't know, they just don't understand the, the capabilities and they, uh, assumptions are made. Right. Um, spending a number of years as a personal trainer, right? I, I went to Western Michigan University. University. I got my bachelor's in exercise science. Um, I worked as a, a master personal trainer, assistant fitness manager for 24 hour fitness down in, down in Florida, South wow. Florida for a number of years. And, um, you know, there were certainly people, uh, members of the gym and community and stuff that, you know, would look at me doing training using, you know, I've got my cane with me, I'm coaching my clients and stuff. And they're just question marks flying all over their heads. Right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. how does this work? How, you know, how is this even possible? What, what in the world is going on? So there's still a lot of misunderstandings out there, but I think it's better now than it has been in the past. Um, I think a lot of doctors, um, through some, some, uh, experiences of their own, but also through, you know, uh, blindness organizations and advocacy groups that, you know, kind of go to them and say, Hey, you know, you have this kid that comes into your office, you're going to diagnose them with visual impairments, give them this, you know, here's some pamphlets, here's some information packets, you know, make sure that you don't give them that kind of dire diagnosis, you know, it's mm -hmm. not the end of the world. And, um, you know, so there's, I think just a lot more growth and understanding now than, than there was at that time. 
Yeah. What about the camps and stuff? Like when when you 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 were introduced to goalball at a, at a camp. How old were you? Like around that time. Yeah. So I would have been, uh, 15 years old, uh, at that time, just turning 15. So, you know, 14, 15 years old. And, you know, I grew up in a family of athletes. Um, my dad played football and baseball and, you know, he golfs now my, my sister played all seasons of sports, volleyball, basketball, softball. And so, you know, I was used to that setting. I was used to being around sports, but, uh, you know, again, 14, 15 years old, my vision starts to really decline pretty, pretty quickly. And so those things that I loved to do, um, basketball, especially, but, uh, baseball was a family sport. Like I just, I couldn't do it. Right. I couldn't do those things anymore. And so when I got introduced through these, these sports camps, which had been happening for many, many years prior to me, uh, attending my first one, it just a whole new world kind of opened up to me. Uh, and it was so impactful, so impactful. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of, um, what you're doing now is going to camps similar to that and talking and, and, and helping in at those camps, or do you have your own camps or what, what are you doing these days yeah. with your motivational speaking and how are you impacting like kids of that same kind of age? So it's really a a variety of experiences for me. So I I don't run any camps. I do a lot of volunteering, a lot of um, speaking at different uh, camps, different organizations as well. So, uh, you know, I've worked uh, with college transition programs, you know, kids going from high school to collegiate um, uh, settings. Um, I've, I've done different speaking events with uh, schools, regular schools, uh, schools for the visually impaired, uh, churches, different organizations. So I'm, you know, I'm all over the place when it comes to that kind of stuff, but I, I kind of have a special place in my heart for, uh, camps that involve sports and activities. Cause that's really what set my feet on this path. So anytime I have a chance to be part of one of those, I, I definitely jump at the opportunity. Yeah. And I, I bet that's really rewarding when you, when you open the, you know, open a door just for someone like it was open for you of just Absolutely. seeing that there's this whole other world of Olympic sports and, and other sports that you can, you can play. And this a community of people that are not going to, you know, feel sorry for you and all that. It's like, okay, well me too. Let's go, let's play. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's so, it's so refreshing and, you know, just, and the wider ripple that that will have, you know, I, I like sport. I, I love being active. I love being outdoors. Um, but you know, you and I both know, and, uh, that, that has a wider impact on your life. You learn things like perseverance, you learn things like teamwork and dedication, discipline. Um, and, and those things apply, you know, so when, when I get an opportunity to do these things, I, I think, you know, okay, you know, it's cool. I'm not just teaching them sport, but I'm teaching them life, Yeah, you know, and, uh, when you've had some of those experiences, you know, I'm, I'm in the, in the gold medal match in a stadium full of people in, in Rio 2016. And, um, I'm standing in the white house, shaking president Obama's hand and, you know, wearing a medal and, and doing all these really cool things. It's like, after something like that, a, a simple job interview doesn't seem so intimidating, right? <laughs> you know, so it has this wider ripple effect that, you know, you get these kids involved in these situations where they're pressured and they're molded and they're pushed and formed and grown. And it, it improves their quality of life down the, down the long stretch for sure. And it's, it's really exciting to be part of that. What about with the families? Um, Cause that's, you know, obviously, you know, so, so many times well-meaning people that love you very much are so concerned about safety, whether you're blind or whether you're completely physically capable. Uh, you have these helicopter parents that, that just are so afraid that the kids are going to get hurt. How is that in, in this community? And how do you, do you ever have an opportunity to talk to the parents about this journey that the kids are going on? And what, what do you tell them? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a funny thing because, uh, you know, variety is, is the spice of life. Right. And that (laughs) parenting styles are, you see them all when, when you get a chance to interact with the, the parents of, of these uh, visually impaired kids. And 
um, it, it really does span the spectrum. You know, some parents that are like getting their kids involved in everything and my kid's going to be going to be a superhero and they're going to do it all to the other ones that are like, I was dragged into this event. I don't want my kid here. My kid's not blind. I'm going to take care of them, Wh- whatever, you know, their, mm-hmm. their mentality is. And, um, it, it is really cool to be able to talk with them directly and share our stories. You know, my, my wife and I are both visually impaired. So my wife is blind mm-hmm. as well. Um, she lost her vision when she was two years old to a childhood cancer. Um, we've been married 20 years. We've had, we have four kids. We homeschool our kids. Um, two of them are grown and flown, graduated from college, uh, working full time. Like it's, it's, uh, it's a cool thing to go to these parents and say, look, your kids are, are not incapable of these things. Right. Just even, even based off of our experience, like sharing our stories with them and seeing them kind of wake up a little bit and look at each other and realize, Oh, maybe we've been holding our kid back too much. Maybe we've been trying to keep them too safe and, and uh, not let them experience life a little bit. Cause you know, kids need to fall. Sometimes kids need to scrape their knees every once in a while. They need to climb trees and get bumps and bruises. And, um, unfortunately all too often, uh, kids who are blind and visually impaired, they just have the, uh, you know, parents or, or gym teachers or whoever have this assumption that they're more fragile and more at risk and they get put on the sideline way too often, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's just, it's something that we're, we're combating against pretty, pretty regularly trying to convince parents, like let your kids go out and and do these things, experience life a little bit. Yeah. And so one of the things that, that you do is help, um, visually impaired people with, with physical training, right? Like that's what revision training is. So how did that, how did that start? Yeah. So really what happened, um, you know, I, I, got my bachelor's degree and became a personal trainer because I, I was an athlete. I was, I was very interested in, um, how to be the best athlete that I could be. And eventually that translated into what well, cool. I, I bet I could teach others how to do this, right. How to become fit. And so I just, I loved personal training. I'm, I'm, I have a teacher's heart, um, and fitness was always something I really enjoyed. So I kind of meshed the two together. Right. So, I'm working as a personal trainer. I'm working full time. I've got, you know, dozens and dozens of clients that I'm working with on a regular basis. And, um, I, I'm, you know, my wife, like I said, we've been married 20 years now. She's super connected on social media and different, uh, uh, blindness groups and, uh, blind parenting and things like that. And so, you know, we're, I'm working and and we're living in South Florida. I'm working at the gym and I, I come home from a, a day of working at the gym, it's late, I'm tired. And, you know, Hey, so-and-so was on this group and they're asking about fitness and, and if there's anything accessible out there, any accessible apps or videos or anything like that, and you should really get on there and, um, help, you know, teach them what, what, you know, and my typical response was like, I just, I just trained people for 10 hours straight. Like I'm not (laughs) interested. right now. And, but I, I knew this need was out there even from my own experience, right. I'm, I'm going through classes, uh, at Western Michigan university and I have to spend tons of extra time in, in the office hours with my professors. Like, Hey, can you explain this graph to me? I can't see it. And, you know, I'm checking out, you know, different models of bones and muscles and, you know, learning all this stuff, just slogging through all of this though. I know how difficult it is to learn fitness as a person who's blind and visually impaired. Right. I I knew all of this, you know, if I, if I came to you, Tom, and you know, with, with no prior knowledge whatsoever, I put a blindfold on you and said, okay, now do a a three sixty Frankenstein squat or something. I'm just going to make up an exercise and just, just do it like this, you know, follow me like this. And you're standing there with this blindfold on going, what in the world is this guy doing? You have Mm -hmm. no idea. Right. And so, um, there was one, one particular event that kind of solidified this idea for me where I stepped back and said, you know, I really got to do something about this. Um, so I'm working at the gym. Um, I'm standing at the front desk. I'm waiting for my, my next client to come in. And, um, there was only a handful of people who were actually visually impaired at this gym, right? I, 99.9% of the people I worked with just average gym going, uh, clientele. And, uh, so I heard a white cane 
<laughs> kind of tapping its way to the counter. It's like, okay, so this must be either this person or that person or whatever. I struck up a conversation. Well, this is uh, a, a young mother who had been coming to the fitness center for probably two or three months, She's kind of new to the area. And uh, so I was talking to her. I said, Hey, how's it going? You know, you've been coming in pretty consistently. Everything's going great. How's it? Well, she sounded a little, little down today. And I was like, so what's, what's going on? Why the, why the sad countenance? And she said, well, I've been coming to the gym pretty regularly. I've been walking on the treadmill. I really enjoy it. I was losing weight. And then it just kind of, kind of slowed down and came to a screeching halt. Right. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm not losing weight. Right. Mm -hmm. How often do we hear that story? Yeah. And, uh, so I said, okay, well, totally understood. It happens all the time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a trainer here. I would love to, you know, ask you a few questions. Do you do some of the other classes? Do you do any weight training, any stretching? Do you balance out your routine at all with that kind of stuff? And well, no, I don't, I don't really know how to do that. I was like, okay, cool. Well, let's talk about doing some training. I can set up a program for you, show you how to use this stuff. Um, you know, and working for a commercial, uh, company like that, I, I'm limited, right? I, I, they set the prices, they set the regulations. I can't train anybody outside of that. And unfortunately she was not able to afford the training. Mm -hmm. Right. So she, she kind of walked away disappointed. I was disappointed for her. it. It happened, right. My, there were de definitely uh, hundreds of people I trained. There were lots of people who just, you know, couldn't afford it. I'm going to try it on my own, but this person, this, this woman, she walked away and I thought, you know what? All the other people who said, nah, sorry, I'll have to try it on my own, figured out. I knew they could go upstairs into the weight room. They could look around and say, okay, that person's doing that. I could try that. Uh, you know, they sit down on the machine, look at the picture and okay, this is how it's supposed to move. They could jump into a classroom and follow the instructor, uh, pull up a YouTube video. Right. This, this mother didn't have that opportunity. She couldn't do any of that stuff. Right. There was no resource put together that was helpful enough to, to teach her to do anything aside from the, the treadmill, which the staff showed her like the first day that she came in. That's all she was knowledgeable about doing. Mm -hmm. And I thought this really isn't this isn't really fair. You know, it's, this is not acceptable that she just is stuck and doesn't have any opportunity to to make gains. Right. right. And so that's what kind of spun out this idea is like, OK, I need. I do need to help with this. I need to figure this out. I I'm, I'm standing in a position where I can potentially bridge that, that gap. Right. I, I know the fitness world. Um, I'm very versed in that, but I also know the blindness world and not many people uh, stand at that nexus point. And I think there's something that I can do about it. Nice. And so and how do you start? So I, I start with figuring out, okay, how do I teach the the masses, right? Like I, as a personal trainer, I knew this for a long time that I love working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's, it's such a, a fun experience, but you're impacting one life at a time. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and not that that's a bad thing, but like, if you can, if you can cast wider nets, right. Mm -hmm. Why not do it? And so I thought, okay, I want to create something digital. I want to create something that can be accessed through the net, through, through, uh, um, you know, all over the world through computers. And so, okay, how do I, how would I do this? So I started spinning out these ideas and, and talking with friends and family and, um, writing up plans and, and, uh, designing and implementing started recording, typing, uh, you know, getting with a software company to help me put together this platform and eventually came out with, uh, it's been four months now since the app launched, uh, an app available on iOS and Google play on the web. It's called revision fitness. And it's, it's just a fully audio based fitness app, um, where I use my experience as a trainer and as a person who's blind and visually impaired to describe correct body movements, postures, positions. I use reference points, clock face directions mm -hmm. to essentially describe how to do these exercise in, in great detail so that then somebody who is blind and visually impaired can take those and either do the audio workouts that we have built into the app or, you know, like I said, go into the fitness center and take a yoga class or, or do whatever and be confident that they know exactly how to position themselves in warrior one and, and all of those other things oh, too. So, awesome. yeah. And it's, it's been a, a pretty wild ride. I, I've been working on it for, uh, over three years now. And, uh, the feedback so far has been, been crazy positive. It's been just 
just super, super exciting to see it take off and see the work that you put in come to come to fruition. That's fantastic. Um, and I guess, do you have, do you have gems that, I mean, like I know in the CrossFit space, there's, there's, um, you know, there's a whole adaptive uh, division, right. For all kinds of, of, of everything. And I would imagine that um, maybe some gyms would be more um, maybe open or easier for, for, certain people to, to get into, like if you had a CrossFit gym with a trainer that really knows, I mean, the gym and the group and everything, and I don't know, it's a slightly different model, right? Like, like a CrossFit model is we want you to come back and we want you to have success in some of the bigger fitness places like 24 hour or whatever you call it have a model of we want to get as many people to have a membership as possible. And if they all showed up at the same time, there's no possible way that anybody could <laughs> work out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? absolutely right. So right. it's a little bit different. There's a little yeah. more hands-on kind of, um, um, I don't know, in a CrossFit gym or that type of, uh, of a training environment, there might be a little more, uh, personal touch with, with, with people. What, what, as far as like the type of facility that that a visually impaired person should go to and if if they were using your app or otherwise what what's kind of the best course of action there yeah yeah so um the the app at this point there's uh there's about 150 lessons in the classroom section um different exercises postures positions uh basic body movements uh, there's about 30 plus audio workouts in the fitness studio. There's a couple of basic fitness plans to follow. Every every drop of it at this point is is all body weight movement. Mm-hmm. Um, I started with that so that um, you know people people who are blind and visually impaired, maybe a higher percentage of them, uh, than the average population, it, it's intimidating, right? It's intimidating for anybody who is not familiar with fitness to go into the fitness center. But I think especially for somebody who's blind and visually impaired. So I built all of it to start with as like something you could do in your living room, essentially. Mm-hmm. And from there, uh, growing it into, okay, if you're going to hit weights, you're going to hit machines, all of that stuff that's going to be included in the app in, in the upcoming future, as I, as I kind of work through my queue of things that I'm creating to, you know, to teach, um, that's where, you know, you can go in and access, uh, you know, the weight equipment and, and CrossFit classes and other things like that, that, um, are, are in your neighborhood. And, you know, that's kind of the, the beauty of it and the trick of it at the same time, right. Is the only common denominator here is blindness, Mm -hmm. right? So when you talk about the variety of, of people out there, there are people who would do better, uh, who are blind and visually impaired, who would do better at a planet fitness where it's a little more low key. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit more of a, a comfortable environment. And then there are blind and visually impaired people who would do much better in a CrossFit setting where it's mm-hmm. a big group and you're jumping from circuit to circuit and doing, uh, doing big, you know, Olympic lifts and things like that. So the, you know, again, the beauty and the challenge of this program is that it, it kind of has to encompass anything and everything fitness related. Right. Yeah. So I, I start started with the basics, started with the the body weight movements. I've got a lot of, you know, really light stuff and a lot of far more advanced stuff, you know, burpees and and jump squats and and uh, plyo lunges and other things like that. Uh, but all of it pretty much done in in the comfort of your own home uh, at this point. And and from there, we're going to grow it and expand it to, you know, hey, if you if you want to do a leg circuit on, on, uh, the Nautilus machines, then here's how you do it. Here's what you're looking for kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. that's awesome. I mean, that really is, it's it's really, it's really just such a fantastic thing that you're doing because the, you know, exercise, I don't have to tell you, but exercise just has so many benefits beyond the physical, you know, Uh, tremendous building muscle or, 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 or keeping uh, flexibility through the range of movement. I mean, I almost exercise more, 
uh, for for what it does to my brain than I do for what it does to my body. And I've been training Absolutely. my whole life, right? And yep. and it seems like that's a place where you get to eventually, you know, you're like, yeah, there's plenty of, of benefits for the body, but there's even more benefits for the mind. And it's almost kind of like, it's almost kind of like running, like when you start running and it's just drudgery and it's awful and it's horrible and I've been there and you know, if you yeah, don't run for yeah. a while and you start running again, it's like, Ooh, I don't know how this could ever be pleasurable, but if you keep <laughs> at it, you know, if you keep at it, then there is something called a runner's high and you can experience that. And you're like, wow, this feels effortless. This feels amazing. I love this feeling. I want more of it. And you know, but, but it takes a long time to get there. And then you're kind of like, yeah, well, this, this endorphin rush that I'm getting here is fantastic. But what I really gained from that hour long session was that I had some problems that I was working on in my mind, some challenges or some things going on at work or at home or whatever. And now I, it's clear. I have clarity, yeah. perfect yeah. clarity. Yeah. And I can see what's going on. And that's the benefit, right? Like, yeah. And for people that you know, there's so many things like when you think about like visually impaired people, like it's, why wouldn't they be fantastic at yoga? Like I do yoga 90% of the time with my eyes closed, right? Yep. But someone has to introduce that. Someone has exactly. to show the movement. Someone has to show what this is in some way, show, feel, talk, uh, yep. explain this movement so that somebody can understand it. And then once you do, there's absolutely nothing that would hold you back from being the most most advanced yoga practitioner in the world's ever seen, right? Yep. But yep. there's a huge gap between not ever experiencing it and then learning, you know, a, a handful of positions, 20 positions, whatever that you could go into any yoga class and somebody calls it out and you can you can do it. That's yeah. really really incredible what you're doing and the ripple effects like what what you mentioned before the ripple effects of what you're doing are going to be be amazing um yeah absolutely and and the thing that i am proud of i i don't like to necessarily use the word proud too much because i think that you know this is it's a it's a blessing for me to to be able to do this right mm -hmm. and and the work that i'm putting in and and all of that is just it's me trying to give back uh, to this community. And, uh, one of the things that I really like about what I'm, what this project is, is also, is, you know, it's not just a collection of workouts. You're, you're touching on something, Tom, that I think is just so valuable and so misunderstood when you're not in the, the middle of that, that fitness community mm -hmm. is that there's so much more to it than just a workout, yeah. right? There's, there's so many benefits mentally, physically, even spiritually that yes. happen that, um, and I know that as a trainer, I've, uh, you know, experienced that in myself and with my clients. So the other, you know, I built into this program, um, a lot of my training experience, I have, um, a series of, of action groups that are, are built in lessons where I take users through and, and these are kind of built into the fitness plans where it's like, okay, action group one, let's, you know, think it through is, is what it's called. And it's, let's sit down and let's talk a little bit about your goals. Why are you here? What's, what's the purpose of this? What are you really aiming for? What's your, what's your X factor? You know, what are you trying to get out of this whole experience? And, um, using these, these steps, these different action groups, I've got like, you know, almost 40 different, like, to do items through these groups that say like, here's how you set yourself up for more success mm. in this, in this fitness realm. Um, because ultimately it it's going to create more than just a better physique. It's going to create a higher quality of life. Yes. And, and again, something that the blind community, there are plenty of people who are blind and visually impaired, who are very active, fit, successful, but when you talk about percentages in comparison to the average population, it's, you know, they're, we're way behind. Mm. And that's where I want to try to use this program to step in and say, you know what, this is totally doable with the right instruction, with the right knowledge. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it so much. It's fantastic. So like, I've always kind of thought, you know, if I were to, uh, donate my time or or money or or whatever that I would like to do it in this 
world. Like, especially with the experience that I had for my son and uh, just, you know, my son has always said that he would like to start a foundation for, you know, I don't know, his, his, his thought was for kids that needed glasses or some sort of uh, treatment that couldn't afford it. And oh, that's um, fantastic. And, and then I, I, I get behind that. I'm like, yeah, that would be fantastic. I would love that. I'd love to talk to you about that. If, if, if you know of something like that, or, or maybe it's this, like, this is just such a, such a cool thing that I think is you just have the opportunity to help so many people, or maybe, maybe it's not so many people, maybe it's a few people in such a massive way right, that, right. that it's really attractive to me, like what, what you're doing and, and to be part of that. Is there a way that people can help you with, with what you're doing or, or absolutely. What, what do you yeah. do? Do you have a foundation? Yeah. Or what do you have? Absolutely. So um, my, um, everything that we're talking about, my motivational speaking and all of that is, is all funneled through an LLC that I have. Mm -hmm. Uh, so revision training LLC is the name of the company that I founded. So in, uh, 2019, I, I peacefully parted ways with uh, 24 hour fitness and decided to strike out and do, do this venture. Right. And, um, the, the, the biggest thing that I look for right now is, is that community support, you know, so getting the knowledge out there, getting, um, feedback on it. So, you know, people downloading the app, um, and, and contacting me and saying, Hey, this is really great. Did you think about trying this or adding this material in? And, um, <laughs> this world of, of software development is a whole nother, uh, <laughs> world for me, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's a wild, wild ride. I've got a, a list uh, about a mile long of, you know, updates and features I want to add to the app. And so, you know, really the thing that I ask for is people to, to join, join the app, um, download it, create an account, check it out, uh, you know, subscribe to it, give me some feedback, try the workouts, let me know how it, how it comes through, how it sounds, um, uh, you know, sharing it with friends and family, uh, giving me opportunities to do something like this, where I can, where I can share it with the, with a community. And, um, I just, I think that even if you are somebody who is not blind and visually impaired, right. So side note, right. The, the, the program is universally designed. If you are somebody fully sighted, you've never met anybody who's blind, you could still use this app, mm -hmm. right. It's, it's made for everybody to be able to use, um, it's also very text-based, right? So you can listen to the audio. I, I, you know, read out a lot of the stuff. I do all the recordings, but there's also a lot of text-based stuff. So it's, it's universally designed for that. So even if you're not blind and visually impaired, but you're, you're hearing this and you're thinking, man, that's really cool. It's super impactful. Download it anyway, check it out. It's, it's something that you could utilize as well. And the more it's shared, the more it's it's known. I think the the bigger impact it'll have, and that's ultimately what I'm going for is trying to uh, create a, a a big impact with uh, you know the blessings and the experiences that I've had, trying to pay that forward to to the blind community. You know, somewhere out there, there's a, a 15 year old kid losing his vision, and he's he's scared, and his parents don't know what to do. And I I my hope is that eventually this uh, will become a household name, uh, in the blindness community, certainly, but it, even further than that, so that, um, these parents and these kids know that there's so much more available, mm -hmm. right. And, yeah. uh, that maybe this could be the springboard into the next blind astronaut or, or <laughs> whatever yeah. else they want to be. So, um, you know, my, all my contact information's on there. If you have, uh, thoughts and things you want to share, I'm easy to get a hold of Tyler Marin at gmail.com is my uh, email that I use. It's uh, T Y L E R M E R R E N at gmail.com. And um, this is, I'm in this for the long haul. So just asking people to, to go on this run with me. So is your app, uh, is it free or you charge for it or what is it? Yep. Yep. So uh, you can download it on iOS, Google play, um, you can go to revisionfitnessapp.com if you're web-based. Um, you can download it for free, create an account for free. There's a two week free trial to check it out, try it out, um, see what you think, um, access to everything in the program. After that, there's a monthly or annual subscription. 
Um, it's pretty reasonable, uh, especially compared to other fitness apps. It's, it's a cup of coffee a month, uh, for a monthly subscription. Nice. So yeah, it's, it's really easy. And, and again, ultimately because doing the business plan for this, I looked at it and said, well, this is definitely going to be expensive on my end, but I also, I'm not trying to, th- this isn't, this isn't an adventure for me to, to get rich quick or anything like that. What I'm looking for is the opportunity to create this program and to impact lives. And, uh, I, I wanted it to be as, ex, as accessible uh, as possible. And, you know, again, when you talk statistics, unfortunately, there's a pretty high percentage of people who are blind and visually impaired who are unemployed and it can be difficult, you mm-hmm. know, for financially for them to do this sort of thing. So far cheaper than a gym membership uh, and plenty more access is, is really what I wanted to create this program for. So, nice. um, so yeah, you're yes. in South Florida, you said. I, I lived in South Florida for a number of years, moved back up to the Midwest. I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana now, okay. uh, training, uh, with the men's USA goalball team, uh, just competed in Tokyo several months ago. And, um, so right now looking at, uh, our next world championships are going to be in, uh, December. So this fall in Portugal, uh, so looking to qualify for Paris, 2024, man, with all you, have you've, uh, accomplished you still have to qualify every year yeah (laughs) yeah yeah it's uh the team has to qualify and then i have to qualify for the team but uh so yeah it's a lengthy process um top uh top eight teams in the world uh get to go to paris and so it's it's uh it's a fight tooth and nail for sure to to try to get one of those spots what are the strongest teams traditionally so uh on the men's side um, you know, USA is definitely ranked, uh, in the top 10 in the world, uh, Brazil, uh, gold medalists in 2020 previous world champions. Uh, they have very, very good presence, both on the men's and women's side, uh, Lithuania, uh, interestingly enough, small European country, Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic, fantastic gold ball program on the men's side, China, Japan, um, uh, there are several other, uh, European countries, Turkey, uh, you know, all, all strong, strong teams, uh, in our, in our pool. So lots and lots of work for us to do, to, to try to make Paris 2024. Wow. What does the training look like when you, when you, you qualify, you know, you're going, you've got your team together. What does that training look like? Uh, it's, it's pretty intense. So (laughs) the, the reason that we relocated to Fort Wayne, Indiana is we have uh, a residency program there at the Turnstone Paralympic Training Center. And um, so average week, uh, especially in season, we're getting prepped for an event. Um, it's typically three days a week on the court, two and a half hours at a time, two to three hours at a time. Um, and then two days in the weight room, a uh, lot of uh again, depending on when, where we are in the season. So a lot of, uh, heavy power movements, uh, power cleans, push presses, uh, sled pushes, things like that. Um, tire flips, a a lot of explosive stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, when we're on the court, we're uh, a lot of defensive and offensive drills. We wear heart rate monitors. Um, and it's not too uncommon for me to burn close to 2000 calories plus wow. per workout. Yeah. It's wild, right? We're, we're going like crazy and, and goal ball, you watch it, you watch the sport. And I, I think in some ways we make it look a little bit effortless, but the way that I try to tell like, imagine doing burpees for 24 minutes straight. Cause you're, you're down, you're in a blocking position, you dive, you block, you stand up, you backpedal, you throw, you, uh, you're down, you dive, you, <laughs> you block the ball, you sprint out, get it past it. Like you're up and down and up and down and up and down. And you just a lot of leg, a lot of core strength. So, um, definitely is, is pretty taxing on the body. Nice. Well, I've done burpees for 24 minutes straight and you're yes. right. It is taxing. <laughs> it is taxing on the body. It's, it's one of my you're a machine. I'm sure you've done the, so. the, uh, the burpees, the foundation of my fitness. That's the, that's the, 
That's the number one movement, probably. One of, one of the best and the worst, right? Yeah, like, right, exactly. You love it, you hate it, you, you, yeah. you can do it anywhere, but you also want to do it nowhere. Um, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> it's, but what a great, what a great movement for for anybody uh, visually impaired or otherwise, because it really takes very little uh, skill. It takes very little. Uh, it takes zero equipment and it takes very little space. You could, that's a, yep. like a prison workout. You can do it in yeah. a, in a jail cell. Uh, Absolutely. Or in Absolutely. the world's finest gym. And, and either way, it's uh, equally as effective. Um, I had another question uh, that I didn't ask you at the time, but how'd you meet your wife? Yeah. Great question. So uh, my wife actually played goalball as well. Mm. Uh, she, she didn't compete for like the U S team or anything like that, but a great athlete, loved to travel, loved to compete. And, um, so I actually met her through sport. Um, funny enough, when, when I first met her, um, she had been out of the sport for a little while. Um, she, my, my oldest, I said, I have four, four kids. So my oldest son is actually my stepson. And so she had, had a, a baby boy and was out of the sport for a little while. And that's when I kind of got introduced to it and started going to practices and stuff in, in Southwest Michigan. Well, she came back to practice and was like, Hey, you know, who's this kid? And they're like, Oh, you know, he's pretty good. I don't know if you want to play against him yet. You might want to, <laughs> she's like, ah, I'm fine. It's not a big deal. So I actually, <laughs> I gave her a concussion. Oh, in her no. first practice. <laughs> and so my, I, th I say I literally swept her off her feet, but yeah. <laughs> she, her, her claim to fame is, well, he didn't score and that's all that mattered. <laughs> she, yeah. she blocked the shot. Right. And so, yeah, it was love at first hit, I guess. I don't know. We, <laughs> we just, we just kind of struck it off and, and, uh, we, we, uh, ended up traveling to some tournaments together and getting to know each other and the rest was history. So um, that's great. Never, haven't looked back since. Yeah. And she's by far my biggest fan, biggest supporter. Um, you know, she's, I, I do so much of the traveling and competing. She, she holds down the fort while I'm gone and, uh, couldn't, couldn't do any of this without, without her support. So she's, Sounds she's like y'all are a good team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then she's, do you help with the homeschooling as well? Yeah. Yep. For sure. So, uh, like I said before, I kind of got a teacher's heart. So I, I enjoy it. My older kids, um, you know, they have a curriculum, they follow a lot of self self teaching. My six-year-old is a little bit of a different story. So she <laughs> definitely lots of energy. So, uh, I'm the one who, who's usually front runner for teaching her doing the math and the reading and all that with her. But, um, are, are any of your children visually impaired? Yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting question because, uh, the answer is just a little bit convoluted. Short answer is no, none of them are legally blind. Uh, my eye condition is very recessive. So uh, very unlikely that any of my kids would, would show, uh, any signs of my eye condition. Um, my wife though, uh, as I mentioned, she lost her vision uh, due to a childhood cancer. And uh, unfortunately it's a dominant genetic trait. Um, so my older three kids inherited this eye condition. Um, but knowing that they, they may have it, they were treated for it right. Essentially from day one, mm. right. Day one, their, their eyes are getting checked and any, uh, little tumors or anything that showed up in the retinas were, were treated with cry, uh, cryotherapy, laser treatment. Um, if any of them became a little bit more stubborn, there was, there was some more extensive procedures, but, um, you know, you look at them now, the happy, healthy kids, uh, my, my son's got some reduced vision in one eye due to some scarring on his retina, um, you know, some little things like that, but fully sighted, um, for the most part. And just, like I said, a happy, healthy, uh, nice. family. So that's counter, we count our blessings every day for that. Yeah, for sure, man. That's, that's awesome. So, um, I've been preparing for one final question, which I'm sure that you, you get often, um, and, and I want to ask it with, with, with all the respect in the world and I, you know, and not a, not kind of a trivial question, but you're, you're obviously very successful. You're very happy. You have, um, a wonderful family. You've learned tremendous things. If you had the opportunity to go in a time machine and go back and, and live your life sighted or live your life the way that you have, which would you choose? Wow. 
going deep, huh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think that I could count on one hand, the number of regrets that I have with not having vision. Um, you know, I, I'm a sports guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my kids growing up, I encouraged them to play sports. If they didn't want to, they didn't have to, of course. Uh, but when they did, I was always really pumped about it. My, my kids loved playing soccer, living in South Florida. It's a big, big place for rec soccer and travel soccer. So, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the stands with my wife and um, the soccer pitch is pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's going on on the soccer field can be anybody's guess when you're visually impaired. And so, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, you know, this is one, just one of those times I wish I had vision to see my kids moving out there and mm-hmm. see what they're doing. And you know, we had parents around us kind of describing what was happening, but it's, it's a little bit of a diluted experience, you know? And so there's things like that. Um, my, my kids all have beautiful eyes. Um, uh, my youngest one, just bright, bright blue eyes, uh, a lot of hazel and green that runs in my family. Um, and so, you know, one of those things where it's like, man, you know, if I, if I could have vision and just I'd love to see their eyes, mm. um, you know, and I, I've been told time and time again, how, how beautiful my kids are, you know? And so nice. there's, there's those things, but, but, you know, my life is very, very rich. Um, God has blessed me in, in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, there's a, if, if, if I'm allowed to share this, uh, yeah. one, one of my favorite verses, uh, from, from the gospels, uh, I want to say it's the first chapter of John, uh, but Jesus is walking along with his disciples and they see a blind man by the side of the road and the disciples ask him, you know, Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it him? Was it his parents? And um, Jesus responded and said, well, nobody sinned that caused this man to go blind. He was made that way so that the glory of God could be shown in him. Mm. And Mm. I just, I, I just, I try to live my life by that. You know, I'm here for a reason. I'm in this situation for a reason. God has put me here for, for a purpose. And, um, I think it's a little bit, uh, little bit beyond me to say, well, well, what if, why, why can't I go back? Why couldn't I be cited? You know, I'm here because God has me here for a purpose and, and whatever that is, I'm going to trust in that and do the best with what I have. So in the end, I think my answer is no, I wouldn't go back and change it for, for anything. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Um, I have, uh, Another friend, Kyle Maynard, who was born a, a congenital quadriplegic congenital amputee, and uh, he says the same thing. He says yeah. he doesn't have a disability. He says, I don't have a disability. Um, people that have limiting beliefs and, and negative self-talk, they have disabilities. Yeah. I just yeah. don't have arms or legs. Right? right. And he's like, I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, you know? Yeah. And, and uh and and I really feel that he's he's sincere when he says that because he's had an yep. incredibly rich life just like yours. Like you've been to the White House, you've won medals, you've gone to the the Olympics. Like this is incredible. And now you're having this opportunity to to help so many people with what you're doing. I just I just love it. I'm in your corner, man. I I, I think it's fantastic what you're doing. So Appreciate I'd love you. to um I'd love to try to help in some way. Um, and I'd also love to encourage others to help. So download the app. Sounds like the, the, the very simplest way that anyone could, uh, could, could provide immediate, um, you know, support is to download that app and use it and, and it'd be a great resource. Um, other than that, um, we'll put that in the show notes and everything else. Is there any other, um, way that people can support what you're doing? For sure. Yeah. You can reach out to me, send me an email. Um, you know, if you want to donate to the project itself, uh, there's tremendous a number, uh, like I said, of features and functions that are, um, that I'm looking at adding to this program to make fully accessible for the blind, uh, you know, and that, that takes a little capital to, to build that, Hmm. (laughs) build that stuff in. So if it's something where you just, you just want to donate, absolutely reach out to me. Um, and, and I, be happy to, uh, happy to, to, to work with you on that as well. It's just, 
it's, it's a big project. It's going to be an ongoing project. This is going to be something I'm going to be working on for the next three, five, 10, 20 years, who knows? Uh, but I'm in it for the long haul because I, I think that this community uh, needs and deserves something uh, that, that can, can help them bridge this gap. So um, any way you feel like you can, you can help with this, um, I would love to love to hear. So you can go ahead and reach out to me by email or uh, text call, whatever my, my contact information is all over the web and, uh, and on the app too, there's a, if you download the app, there's a contact us section that goes straight to my email. So pretty, pretty easy to get a hold of. Fantastic. I want to train with you sometime. I don't know where I you're going to be. Man. That's why I was saying if you're in South Florida, maybe I could drop by. Uh, I love it. Maybe no, if I go to we'll Indiana, to um, match up sometime, dude. We'll uh, go go through some workouts together. I sure. I was I was going to tell you uh, um, one of the exercises you introduced on uh, Fitness Friday. I've been working on uh, doing the reverse Nordic. All and, right. And, yeah, yeah, kind of digging that. I, hey, well, I, I was it. really, I was really concerned because it was audio and video. I was like, man, I don't know if people are going to be able to to uh, follow this on audio. So I'm going to be really careful about how I describe it. But apparently, go. apparently, it worked. You got it. But that reverse yeah, yeah, Nordic, no, you man, got it. To, it, was, it to, was very uh, cool. That one is that's pretty advanced. Um, it's uh, and and you're obviously a, a great athlete. I have worked on that and worked on that and worked on that to where I can actually raise up from my shoulders being on the ground to raising that's back fantastic. up to, to just being on your knees. And that was, that was tough, man. I, that's I, fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's also just a great stretch just to lay back there. You know, that, that, uh, lie back quad stretch with both. That's the thing that I really, uh, I dig. I kind of recline back and like, Oh man, that feels good. <laughs> Doesn't it? Like your hip flexors and your knees Open everything, and everything, up. man. It just yeah, opens it yeah. up. That guy that I get all those stretches from the Joe hip and steel, you might want to check him out too. Um, I'll he, take a look. He, yeah. Uh, he has something called ultimate human performance. And it's, I mean, he told me when I, I did a private lesson with him and he was saying, you know, this is the fountain of youth. And this guy's like, over 70 years old he he's spry and fit and nimble and flexible and it is the fountain of youth though is that is so cool that that flexibility and range of mo range of move range of motion you know to to maintain that through your life is just it's it's such the fountain of youth but um, oh, it's huge huge returns huge returns and definitely something that i notice about myself as i uh, get a little bit older, <laughs> been playing, been playing ball for a long time. I still play at a very competitive level and, and, uh, but definitely something where I recognize now that a range of motion, flexibility, just maintenance of the body is, is just essential for sport performance, uh, and essential for general health. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. we spend, yeah. we, we don't have to spend very much time on it as as young athletes, we probably should, and it would have benefited us. But as yep. you age and you're getting into being a, a, an older athlete or a master's level athlete, it becomes more and more and more and more important. And you end up spending more and more and more time on that and less and less and less time on the, the actual physical training. Yep. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm training or stretching or getting in the sauna or doing something pretty much all day. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, I, I just get to it. preserve, yeah. just to, Me just too. to be able to continue to do what, what I love to do. But I Tyler, this has been awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing your story and, and, uh, for what you're doing. It's just, uh, it's, it's really great. I'm behind you a hundred thousand percent. So, uh, I appreciate you, Tom. Thank yeah, you so man. much for what you're doing as well. And, and, uh, thanks for giving me a chance to, to step on here and, uh, share a little bit of, of course my story. we'll do it again we'll do it again Sounds when you great. bring home that next gold medal right on. <laughs> no pressure all <laughs> right cool i appreciate it <laughs> all right tyler thank you all right thanks Tom. we'll see you next week